Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 152 for Tuesday, February 6th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Here, uh, I was going to say being a working musician, but right now I'm being a podcaster in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you, podcaster Paul Kent, today? Good. Sorry for the delay here. I, I went away for my wife's birthday and uh, I didn't mark it on our little calendar. You know, the, we have this very technically savvy way of, of uh, scheduling our bi-coastal lives here That's and right. I, I, I blew it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, things happen, right? Things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how, how are is, you? I'm, I'm all right. I am. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned last week I had a, a cold, I think maybe I did. Maybe I was just getting it when we were, when we talked, I don't know, but um, it, it actually was, it went through me pretty quickly um, and I actually had band rehearsal Tuesday night, which would have been like the peak of it. And I had no trouble singing, no problems. I'm like, all right, great. I can deal with this. Perfect. And then came Friday night's gig when things like in theory were better and everything was good. And man, like I, every singing was, mm. a, it was a chore. Like I I hit every note, including like notes that some nights I like, even when I'm in perfectly health, I can't hit. Like there's that harmony note at the end of the bridge in uh, Sister Hazel's All For You. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. No problem. I mean, it was probably the best Johnny D and I had ever locked in on that tune. Right. It was just afterwards we looked at each other like, whoa, OK. But even that, like every note was just a chore to get out it, and including like singing leads and, and certainly every harmony. It, I, I think it was just like I didn't have the, the same air support that I that I'm used to, you, you mm. know. Because my throat was fine. Like I said, you know, hitting notes and that sort of thing was fine. But I just I didn't have that column of air in my lungs and uh, the way that uh, I guess the way that I'm used to. And so it was, it was really, man, it was just work. And yeah, I can totally relate to that. I had a gig on, on Saturday night as well. I'll talk a little bit more about it, but just very similarly to you, th this gig was interesting. It was a corporate gig and we did like a little three song preview set. Yep. Uh, and then about an hour and a half later, we did our main show. And and during the preview set, each me, Simon and Nick each sang one song. And my song was fine, but I felt a little something, right? I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. And then it's like way in the back of my throat, top of my chest. There's like something and I just can't quite clear it out. Yes. And then when it came time to come back and sing, all of a sudden, I guess the closest I could say, it sounded more hoarse than anything else. Oh, there was no pain. You know, there was no pain. And um, there was no no cracking, but just it, it was like something was sitting on my vocal cords, and I just couldn't get them clear. And uh, and and then and then you know the more I tried to work around it, yes. So I tried to push it out, and that's obviously the wrong thing to do. So you totally know, the you, wrong thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And so and so you know about halfway through, I was like, mm, not going to be my night for singing. And luckily enough, the other guys have enough stuff, and I just I just punted to them. But it, it's. The next day I was fine. And I don't know, maybe there was some dust in, in that area. Sure. sure. Something was weird. And, uh, you know, I, I rehearsed on a couple hours tonight and, you know, we'll see if it's back because I feel fine and I felt fine. But all of a sudden the tone was not quite right. And then I could feel that something was, like I said, either at the very top of my chest, on my vocal cords, you know, back, back, back of my throat, somewhere in there, something was just kind of sitting. Yeah. Yeah. That does. It sounds like an allergy kind of thing. The way you describe that. Something. Man. Yep. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. It's, it's frustrating. That was it. And, you know, and this gig, uh, it was the Monkey Fist Trio, but we had um, we didn't we had Russ from Fling playing guitar with us. And we've done that before, uh, but it's been a while since Russ has played with Monkey Fist and uh, Johnny D was playing a lot of guitar, too. So it was different. And we're all comfortable as humans with one another. We're all comfortable playing music with each other sort of separately. But as that lineup, it, it was, it was, uh, we're not comfortable. I mean, it was fine, yeah. but, but there's not that, you know, consistency of, Oh yeah, we've done 
it this way a hundred times. No worries. Like we got each other. There was at any moment, there was that kind of air of, all right, I got to, we all have to be really paying attention a hundred percent of the time to make sure that, you know, we stay together and things go well and all that. So that combined with my voice or my, whatever the mechanics of my voice, I guess. Um, and the set, and we also had like a weird sound issue. It, they, they were both playing acoustic guitars and no matter what I couldn't get, and maybe it's just their guitars or the electronics in them or something, but I couldn't get any like beef out of them. Um, and it wasn't because I didn't have it in the mains. In fact, if I turned up the low end on the guitars anymore, it would have, you know, started to, to hum and feedback. But it was just, it just felt thin. And, and maybe part of that was in my head, you, you know, I mean, it, it like th- things weren't comfortable anyway. <laughs> so it, some nights are that, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things. That, it, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, there's the Nirvana nights where balance, tone, richness and sound just kind of all happen. And then there's the nights where everything is a fight. You know, your sound system doesn't sound the way it did last time. Yep. You know, it, it, there's there is a certain amount of voodoo to all this, I believe. It, there is. Yeah. I, right. I, I And I don't know. I, you know I've, I mean, you know me, I overanalyze everything. And and there's lots of moments from that gig that I would love to have back, but that's not how it works. Um, but, you know, as I was kind of overanalyzing this, it's like, well, if I had gotten the stage sound for the guitars better, like, would that have changed things? Or if we had, you know, if my voice wasn't acting the way it was, would that have changed? Like, is it it would one of these things, you know, was it that all of them were issues or really was it just one and that sort of highlighted anything else and just made yeah. it so that I wasn't comfortable? Because like that's well, what I would a, like to It's fix. the harnessing of the karma gods, right? It, you know, they, like you who get this stuff as a, from a very technical perspective, but still it doesn't make sense, right? You know, no. why does... You know, I guess with tube amps, it makes a little sense that tubes react differently, very subtly to different amounts of electricity. And, yep. you know, unless you, you know, like I don't have voltage regulators on my tube. Maybe I should, you know, but I don't. But I'm always, I notice that my uh, acoustic guitar sounds different on different nights plugged yeah. in. Oh, for I sure. notice that my Bose system sounds different on different nights in different venues, even though I'm right on top of it. Yeah. So, well, I, I, mean, I don't know. There's, different venues, I mean, totally make a difference in the sound you've got the room make, but i'm right on top of that system so i'm not matter. really hearing the room no you but that's the thing i mean you've been in an anechoic chamber right have mm-hmm. you it, like it's it, you always are hearing the room <laughs> it's it factors in so much more than you might um that then you then you like are aware of in the moment but but it really is um so I, yeah i don't know it's just Frustrating because I I was looking forward to the gig. It was like, God, oh, this is going to be fun. And it was like, and and it was one of those gigs. I had not put out a Facebook invite for it uh, all week. Nobody had, and so at like three o'clock in the afternoon with a seven thirty downbeat, I was like, Oh crap! I really should do this. <laughs> so I did it, and man, there was like, like, like it brought a ton of people out. So wow. yeah, not only where we play in this gig where things weren't going quite right. But like every five minutes I turned and looked at the door and here was another friend walking in. How funny Like that. I would never have seen it at any other gig, you know, and they walk See, in dude, like, this hey. is the message to you. Don't don't even you who I know and I love, you can't control everything. You know, Nope. I bet seven times out of 10, a last minute Facebook gets lost in the noise and people already have plans. Totally. And, you know, right. Yep. You, you, you probably hit the wave where, there wasn't a lot being posted at the time by, you know, com- things competing for the algorithm at Facebook. Yeah. People were available. Right. So you just got to kind of go with it. They, it's, it's a lesson in humility. It totally is. Well, and it's also a lesson like like classic marketing 101, which is do all of the things all of the time. Mm. It, you know, it, it, you know, it's 50 percent of my marketing works. I just don't know which 50 percent. Right. That's right. You know, and so. Oh, well, <laughs> the other 50 percent is the answer to that. Right? <laughs> it's always the other. <laughs> Whichever you think it is, it's the other 50 percent. <laughs> and then it changes. <laughs> yeah. That is back to the, the previous 50 percent. Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So I played um, a gig on Saturday night. It was for, you know, uh, big, the big children's musical theater that was in our town, which is a very, a very big organization, very professional organization. A lot of the kids literally grow up in, you know, in this, under this umbrella, several have gone on to 
to Broadway, you know, they do a great job of they cast every kid who comes out for shows uh, is a policy of theirs. So even if you're a tree or a leaf or something like that, you get a part in every in every play. They do a great job in developing children's self-esteem. I mean, there's a lot of great life lessons that go from being a part of this musical theater. They're a great organization in our community. So they have a yearly fundraiser. Uh, it's kind of fun. It's held at the City National Civic Auditorium in San Jose. So, you know, for the last several years we've played this, it's a stage where Sinatra has played, the Rolling Stones have played. You know, it's just, it's kind of cool. And some of the memorabilia that's kind of in the back, in the green rooms and stuff in the halls is actually pretty remarkable. Oh, but that's pretty cool. anyway, yeah. it's a really long night because they've got their business to do. They got their fundraiser stuff. Sure. You've done these things before, <laughs> sure. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, so, of course. you yeah. know, we, we get to load in around 3.30. Um, we have to sound check at five and be done, 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 done. No more sound by five forty-five. Um, that's when they open the doors and they have their cocktail hour. And so there's no, there's no more setting up going on in past years. They've been rehearsing the show that they do. Um, uh, they do it. They build a stage in the middle of the floor of the of the auditorium, kind of in the round type of thing. And then we play on the formal stage where where performances have been. But uh, before we've actually not even had a sound check, just a line check. And so it's been really unnerving, but this year we got a sound check, but again, it's done by five 45. Then around eight 30, they give us a nice dinner. That's around seven o'clock. Then around eight 30, we do this preview in the past. It's been one song. This year was three songs. And then, you know, the, and in the midst of all this, they're doing their dinner, their cocktail hour, they're doing their, their performance of the musical theater as part yep. of the evening. It's a really long night. We end up playing then 10 to 12 at night. And, but the people have been there, like I said, the, the doors open at six. So many people have already been there for four hours. Sure. And so once they get done performances, dinner, cocktail hour, um, it's six at 10 at night. You know, the curtain opens and we provide dance music for the end of the night. That's and it. I'd say out of the, yep. about the 500 people who come, you know, about 100 people stay for the dancing, which is not bad. Um, but it's a long night. It's really fun because, you know, the kids who are the performers are and, and some of them are now adults are amazing dancers and they're really into it. It's a party for them and they just bring this great energy and they get into the music. So that's really a lot of fun. But it's just a very, very, very long day, which, you know. Weddings are long days too, right? I was just right? going to say, this reminds me of like a wedding or a, you know, a private function kind of gig. The the flow of a very organized evening where you have a role to play, but you are a cog in the wheels of this much greater thing. And, and it's not about you, right? So your sound check, you know, when you said sound check must be over by a certain time, I was reminded of our gig that we did at the Flint Center. When when we played uh, to open up the night for the yeah. Mac 30th celebration, like we got on stage and we're like, yeah, OK, cool. And uh, mm -hmm. we do our sound check and we were, you know, a few songs into a sound check and somebody walked on stage and they're like, all right, it's over. And they, they were I don't want I don't want to say they were angry, but like there was no discussion, right. you know, discussion with this person. This was this was the lay of the land and they had other things to do. We were just a cog in the wheel and weddings are like that, too, for sure. So well, and when then the, doors you just open, gotta, the doors open, right? yeah. And then you got to turn your switch on at, yeah. you know, at 10 o'clock to be the thing that they they hired you or, or in this case, you know, that they asked you to be. Yeah, without a doubt, without yeah. a doubt. And and. It, in years past, so again, th I want to talk about the evolution in my band of the relationship between the horn section and the rhythm section. So um, the guys who play horns for me are are more or less pro horn players. And with that comes a few things. You know, they they assume, put a chart in front of me and I'll read it down. That's that's one line of thinking. Sure. Um, they're like, when's downbeat? You know, why do I have to be there so early? You know, that that's another line of thinking. And it took me a long time in the evolution of my band to make it feel like one band instead of a rhythm section with a hired horn section. Yes. It took a lot of real like hard ass attitude on my p part. And this is the type of gig where in early years... They would be like, dude, you know, for 200 bucks, I'm not going to spend nine, ho nine hours with you, you know, yep. that type of thing. And I'd be like, well, it, now it's like, well, if you want 50 more gigs a year, <laughs> you are going to do that. <laughs> this right? is how it so, works. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the concept of leverage is what comes into play here, like in most things. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing. These long days in my band, it's been a, a mantra. We're all in this together. Right. Yes. We, we share in this. Right. And it, uh, Again, when you bring in ringers or hired guns, a lot of times 
they play by different rules because they're used to playing by different rules. Like, yeah, in, no, you have in, to retrain them for sure. Yeah. Yep. And I, I noticed that in the theater world too. In fact, I, maybe I'm stupid and maybe musicians will be mad at me, but it, you know, in the theater world, the musicians are treated like your horn players are talking about. Like you show up for what you need. And when the, the, like the, when the run is over, you pack up your stuff and you leave. Even if yeah. everyone that you've worked with for the past, whatever month is still there, like taking apart scenes and all that stuff. And it's like, like that, like the first time I did that, you know, I packed my stuff up in my car and, uh, you know, I went back in and I was like helping other people load out like you do when you're in a band. And yeah. after I, after like 20 minutes, somebody looked at me and they're like, what the hell are you doing here? Like you're a musician. Like, <laughs> everybody else has left. I'm like, well, yeah, but like, no, they're like, no, get out of here. But it brings up an interesting yeah. concept. It's like, especially with hired guns. It's like, yeah. yeah. When you sub somebody or hire a gun, I, I will make the point that it's okay to pay them less than the fair share that are, that a normal band member that a band guy mate gets. gets. Absolutely. He's put in the rehearsal time. Yep. He's put in those long days of time. Right. Well, it's a it's, different thing. It's part of the, I mean, that one person is part of the band. You could think about it like, you know, you're, you're part of uh, the company versus you're just hiring a contractor to do a little, you know, piece of work for you. You pay. Yeah, the, and this typically works out really well because it, it actually works in a much more copacetic way. Than, than might seem on the surface because sure. with guys who are hired guns, you say, I got this gig. Do you want it? And they yep. say, how much is it? And you say, here's the fee. And, and you, you agree all that type of stuff and it's done. That's He's it. not asking you how much are you making? And, and uh, you know, is it being split, you know, fair ways? He's just saying you're, you're making an offer. I'm accepting an offer. And we go from there. Now I actually one time, one time only in all the years I've been playing, had uh, a guy I was using as a sub on trumpet and uh, and we made this agreement and he bailed the day before a gig because he got a better paying gig somewhere else. Not only will I, would I never call him again, I made sure every horn player in my band knew what he did so they don't refer him. Yeah. And if anyone was to ask me, I would say, I would tell him exactly this story. I would basically say, you know, he did this to me. He might do it to you. Yep. Oh, totally. Yep. Oh, that, yeah. that I, I ran into somebody that One did time. that recently. You get to do that once. Once. A absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, he was a great player, but different. I would not put it up. Yeah. No. He was, he was an excellent player. I don't get how he kept his, I don't get, I would think that that kind of business goof wipes out how good a player you are. I mean, again, he's just a member of a horn section. I mean, it's not, it's not like he's a featured soloist that we're building a whole show around, Right. you know, he's just a guy. Right. And so he was very good. He came, he read great. His tone was great. His pitch was great, but that's great. You know, yeah, that's great. <laughs> yep. His, his unemployment with me, I hope is great as well. Well, yeah, that's right. It's man. Yeah. You can't do that. Like just not Okay. Yep. So, hey, um, sorry about your football team, your local guys there. Uh, congratulations to all the Eagles fans out there. That was a great Super Bowl, man. Really, wasn't it? congratulations to anyone that doesn't in live in New England because it seems like most of the people <laughs> that don't live here just hate the Patriots. So, well, you guys have had a pretty extraordinary run. As a lifelong Yankee fan, I can empathize with that with that perception. <laughs> yes. I love Tom Brady. He's a local guy from here. That's what right. he's what yeah. he does and is doing and will continue to do seemingly forever, but um, <laughs> certainly for the near future, yeah, Brady's awesome, you know, yep. and he played, he threw for 500 yards. How can you be bummed at <laughs> Brady? Right. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, they didn't, you know, they compared to how they normally would play. They didn't play for the first half and, you know, and the Eagles they gave, put together they gave an up amazing over game. Yeah. They gave up 41 points. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, a lot. Anyway, yeah. fun Super Bowl, but uh, you know, the music in the middle, it was particularly interesting. I, I'm not a huge follower or on, I get, I get Timberlake, you know, I get that he's one of the biggest stars on the planet. Sure. Um, he, I think he's wildly talented. I mean, that was a very athletic performance. I mean, all that dance and all that running around from stage to stage up into the stands and while singing breathlessly was pretty cool. Um, we, we assume uh, I know he was singing breathlessly. I mean, his, his, the mix was awful. 
So oh. I was watching in a bar and it was pretty noisy. So okay, so you didn't. I know. could hear little bits of the audio. Tell me, tell me what you heard. Oh, it, I mean, it was it was exactly that. The bar had nothing to do with the fact that you couldn't hear Timberlake's vocals. It, they were buried, and and it was that classic thing where they just had way too much saturation of the sound. And and, you know, everything gets compressed like 16 different times between the cats running into an audience of, you know, 60,000 people. How, how do you mix that? Well, it doesn't matter. They're, they're not mixing it for. Well, they are mixing it for them there, but there's a separate mix for us on TV. So, they no, but, could, but the source that he would they take, his body is physically in the middle of 60,000 people. Yeah. I don't care what microphone you have. There's going to be additional noise. There is. But but their choice was to just keep his mic level low as Ooh. opposed to turning it up and maybe letting some bleed happen. Right. So it was the, the vocals were very, very lost in the mix. Um, and he didn't it, look out of, out of breath. How's that? I'll, no, he definitely I, I'll didn't. Just watching it. So. No, I was just using that as an as a as a way to talk about the the fact that the sound sucked. But but no, I I mean he did a very athletic thing uh, and and kept his composure the whole time. Like for as, sure, as good as Mick Jagger ever has been in terms of that you know movement combined with singing and and all of that. So yeah. Yeah. A great entertainer, you have to say that. Totally. Oh, I've, uh, yeah, I've you always seen liked, him live. No, I've never seen him live, but I've always liked him. I mean, I've always, and I've always respected him. But but more than that, I've, I've you know, I mean, he he's done some great stuff. But well, uh, the, seeing the that guy excited enough, that. he's coming in April. He's coming in April, and I would go see him now. Huh? You would? Oh, good for you. Expensive. Yeah. So and then there was a little bit of controversy about his nod to Prince. Huh. <laughs> yeah. So evidently there's a, there's a, a Timberlake song where he takes a dig at Prince. Is that right? I, I don't know enough about Timberlake to, um, to, to comment on that. I have no uh, idea. Yeah. I have no idea. So yeah. I just saw, I saw again, I didn't have great audio, you know, but I saw the purple, I saw the screen go up sure. and then on Twitter, um, you know, there was some like, dude, not cool because evidently there's a, there's a song where he takes a direct swipe at Prince and oh. that this seemed like it was a, it was a little bit, condescending to you know in minneapolis to do that so, yeah to so, be in minneapolis and do that yeah yeah but it's not really a minneapolis show it's really a you know a billion people watch this thing i mean i, I mean that it's in minneapolis was okay but yeah that i i would have a hard time tying that message to and he seems like an earnest guy so when he says prince is one of his his big influences oh i believe that 100 percent Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, look at him. It's you know, it's Prince, it's Michael Jackson. It's I mean, you can see a lot of the influences right there, and and he delivers them well. I, I in general, I think, yeah. It, well, cool. you, you know, I actually had JT at the Super Bowl queued up to talk about last week. Um, the, actually, the, the but I before we leave the mechanics of the Super Bowl, when that marching band came out on stage uh, uh -huh. to play to play along with him. Every single member of that marching band was wearing in-ears. And I started thinking about like all those radios. I mean, maybe they all had the same mix. So maybe they were all receiving the same signal or at least, you know, they chopped up the signal. So it wasn't 65 different in-ear mixes. But man, what a logistical nightmare to like well, throw, dude, throw that together at the, you know, in 10 minutes. Go set it up. Go, you know. Yeah. yeah. You well, know. so the, the gig I did Saturday night, I told you that they, they built a stage in the on the floor. Yeah. Right? 35 wireless mics. Oh, that's worse than theater. And I so mean, this guy, well, it is theater. So, so the guy, the guy, oh, right. uh, and it's 35 because it's this big ensemble, you know, of course, show of shows type of thing. Anyway, so one of the guys, the, I think there was, the wireless team specifically was two guys. And when we came and got ready to sound check, he comes running out of nowhere and he's like, start turning your shit off one at a time. I got to find the one that's interfering with my stuff. Oh, right. Right. So, yeah. Oh Yeah. Yeah, it is always fun to watch a sound man like freak out about something like that. I mean, it's <laughs> it, it's not fun, but at this point in time, when it's all over and everything worked out, it it's like, oh yeah, that guy was losing his mind for yep. a second. Yeah, 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 but that's his job to lose his mind. That's make his sure job, it's right. and he yeah. was on it. And then we solved it. And actually, when we came back up, everything was fine. But <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, definitely those those big product. I think overall, you you have to say these Super Bowl halftime productions are amazing <gasps> it's things. Amazing How do they to get watch. the stages set in five minutes? It's how they, you know, all this stuff is just unbelievable. I'm trying to think of which band it was that played the Super Bowl. And I can't remember, but I was reading an article about something and they said that they had a 600 person crew mm. to assemble the stage. And, you know, I would think minutes. all of them do. Well, I guess that's true. Right. It's got to be something like that. Yeah.
But, you know, I had it on last week because we talk about making sure you get paid for your gigs. Right. And not doing gigs for free and definitely don't do gigs for exposure. Right. Like all of that is like like you'll you will more often than not wind up doing a disservice to your fellow musicians and local community by taking those types of gigs uh, in general. I mean, there's some, you know, exceptions to every rule, but in general, avoid gigs for exposure. Well, Timberlake's gig at the Super Bowl was a gig for exposure. He does not get did not get paid to perform there. Except all of his expenses were covered, including all of the expenses of all of his bandmates and any, you know, support staff that he needed. Yeah. It's just Timberlake that doesn't get paid. So, he gets a hotel room, he gets shuttled to and from the gig, basically from his house wherever that might be, if that includes an airplane, so be it. Uh, you know, and then but he doesn't walk away profiting at anything. That's very different than when you or I take a gig for exposure. When well, he also has a, he also money. has something else that he's selling right now, right? He has Correct. a new album out, Correct. and so he he has something he's selling. So advertising and and um, and promotion mean different things at different stages of things. And That's also, right. there's a little bit of the intent there, right? Sure. So if, you know, if someone is saying, "I will offer you exposure." And they can't guarantee that exposure. Yes. You know, like, you know, if the premise is I'm, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to talk to me uh, and I'm going to take advantage of you. I mean, my premise is me taking advantage of you. Right. I don't, I think, you know, Timberlake is far savvy enough to, to have weighed the value of these yeah. things it's and totally a worldwide cool. audience, a global audience of a billion people to sell a new album to and sell, sell concert tickets to is probably a, that's a pretty you know, good gig. I I'd pretty take good that gig. Yeah. Yeah. That's different than a bar that has nobody in it asking if you want to play for exposure. Totally. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because there was there was a few news articles that I saw where they talked about, wow, you know, everybody that performs at the Super Bowl does it for free. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's put this into context here. If I could do a gig in front of a billion people, I would take it every time, every time. But that's not necessarily yeah. a billion the case. people is a lot of people. That's not necessarily the case when you get, you know, the the local new brand new club owner that's looking to, you know, weasel uh, into the market by taking advantage of of unsuspecting musicians. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, we could, I guess you could take the path that like, well, come on, NFL. Right. You know, yeah. You know, you make so much money, you you get well, that, so much treatment. That's a whole you know. different story. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we could go down there about the philosophical rights that of what an organization who has the money should do and to make it win win to respect music. Yep. And I guess you could actually say this. The NFL does not respect music. Right. You could actually say you could if the NFL respect the musicians. They would pay something, even a token amount. Totally. That's right. You get a stipend or something. That's totally right. So, yep. There you go. Yep. I know. I know when we've played, um, we've played gigs and I know other bands have played gigs at our local football at the 49ers. And, you know, it's a struggle to get a fair pay for that. I, you right? know, I, I have to rewind though, because I, I actually know that the NFL, at least they used to, I, I, I was part of selecting one of the Super Bowl lineups just by happenstance one year. Uh, only because I was at a band rehearsal and the, the, the house that we were at, the guy's wife worked for the NFL and she was re she really was working. And it was like, she was like, who should we get? And I was like, well, James Brown would be good. Cause we just played at James Brown tune at rehearsal. And sure enough, you know, James Brown showed up, but, uh, but she cared back then, but that was, you know, 20 years ago. So who knows <laughs> actually 30 years ago. Yeah. 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 Yikes. Well, interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, we have this interesting theme that's kind of developing. I posted a picture on our Facebook community of uh, Jackson Brown playing for tips on a Monday night. Did you see that? I, I loved that. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have this other very interesting thing where you shared a note from Paul Simon, where he's announcing the end of his touring life. And there's a lot to reflect on in both of these things. The first one for me is, you know, us as the weekend warrior guys, um, there is still a connection to the immortals who break through and, you know, change people's lives with their music and do those types of things. There's still musicians and in that, you know, there's a bond and, you know, you've played with guys who've, who've made it pretty big and they're just guys and they just appreciate a good jam. Right. I mean, totally. at the essence, that's, that's, 
the thing that connects musicians is just the love of a good jam, it, it right? It is, right. Yeah, once you're, once you're kind of in the moment together and all the other stuff is stripped away, then, it, yeah, everybody's just there to play. That's what yeah. you do. Yeah. And I, I thought Simon's note that you shared was really extraordinary. It was so frank and honest and human. It sounds like something you or I would write. I mean, it really, that tone of, you know, I just have appreciation for those who have connected with the music. Um, I, as a human being, have always wondered what would happen when this day comes where I just don't want to do it anymore. And, you know, that's something anybody's ever picked up an instrument someday when they literally can't get the pleasure out of doing it or physically, emotionally, whatever it might be. It, it sounded like that. And so to me, the, the, you know, I don't know if this is where what you were thinking, but those the, those two things that happened over the past week, me posting the Jackson Brown picture and you posting the Simon thing actually have a connection in that even these people who are in the stratosphere, you know, in the clouds with the gods. Yep. They pick up their instrument and they play because they have to, just like we do. They play because they have to. Yeah, because they're driven to. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. because it's inside them and they got to get it out. It, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I For a guy who has, I mean, I've never, I don't know, Paul Simon, obviously, or, or if not, obviously, I'm saying it. But, you know, he's gotten a lot of flack throughout his career for being a massive egotist and, and he's even, you know, showed that at times, right. That side of him has come out. And for that letter to be this, you know, non egotist side, I mean, it's obviously it's about him. So you certainly could find that in there if you want it, but it did not come across that way to me. It was like you said, this very honest human, uh, humble, even self-reflection, self-reflection. Yeah. Yeah. But, but an honest self-reflection, not, I agree. he wasn't trying to spin the narrative. Although he did say, you know, my voice is good. My, you know, he didn't want to like, I, I, to me, that was less about him trying to change the facts than, than it was him trying to say, look, don't read any further into this than what I'm telling you at face value here. There's not some yeah. hidden reason here we are. And, and it's okay. And I also like, like the thing that really resonated with me was the part where he said, uh, you know, I'm going to let this tour end. And then I hope to play, you know, some gigs in some, you know, nice acoustically tuned rooms throughout the rest of my life. Like there wasn't this big fanfare of I'm drawing a line in the sand. This is <laughs> it. Right. Because I mean, we all know that that most like the Rolling of the time, Stones or the Eagles farewell tour. Yeah. That that's just doesn't happen. Right. I mean, it's, it's been who this person is for their entire life. And now you're just going to shut that part of yourself off. Like, I hope not. Like, I hope that part still lives and whatever way you want it to come out, uh, it's going to. And that's really what he said was it's, I'm just going to let it happen but it's not going to be this intentional, okay, it's January 1st, we should think about booking a tour. Really, actually, I think that starts like in November for the following year. But, you know, whatever it is, like the, the machine is stopped. And then it's just going to be about, if do I want to play a gig? Do I feel like I can? Is it, a, is it the right opportunity? Awesome, I'll go play a gig. And then he said he'll donate that money to charity. I didn't, he didn't yeah. even need to say that, uh, you know, but whatever. I mean, it's well, great, you know, yeah. I'd add that... Um Similarly, Elton John announced that he's going to do his last tour, 300 dates. So it's a massive tour. Um, Simon, Elton John. I mean, there is an interesting thing to think about in that the ethereal members of music royalty are, you know, they're dying and they're, and they're aging out and, you know, th there's something happening. And I've said this many times, you and I are slightly different on this. There's not really music from the 90s or artists, maybe not music, but artists from the 90s and, and past that um, seem to have the willingness or the catalog to become that kind of ethereal forever music. Maybe. I mean, I, I feel like the Foo Fighters will be that. Um, I, you know, I mean, they've written some songs, not not all of them. But some songs that I think will enough of them will last that that they will be seen as part of that canon. I, I think it's frankly too soon to to levy that judgment. I mean, with some bands, you listen. Here's to why stuff. I don't think it's too soon. All right, you don't see that music being played by cover bands. They're not they're not getting people out. Oh, so, so I don't know about that. See, maybe, this is where you and I differ. Yeah, maybe I, yeah, you're, like the, you're not seeing it played by cover bands, but I mean, right. I'm playing it in cover bands. 
Very little. Huh. Very, very little. Huh. You're, so you're not so, playing like um, uh, the, the Walk the Moon tune? Like they're a good band, right? Uh, one song. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. They've actually had several good tunes. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing else has kind of crossed my mind as something else to cover. There's, There are undoubtedly some good songs. I'm not de- denying that. I mean, sure. it was good, not, it's not that there was bad music. I'm saying that there's not the level of majestic permanence in the music that came out of the 60s, 70s, and, you know, even to the, into, into the 80s to some degree. And, you know, I just don't see it being covered. I mean, again, most of the covers that I see are still 60s, 70s, and 80s covers. There's some, but most of it, you're more likely to see a Motown cover band than you are to see a grunge, <laughs> you know, if you want to yeah. talk genres. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but again, I, I mean, think of course, of course, Nirvana's hits will probably last in a really long time. Oh, I th- actually, I think Nirvana will be seen as that type of band for sure. Huh. Yeah, yeah, because the songwriting's there. I, I mean, that's really where it comes, what it comes down to, right? Is um, you can have a band that's got tons of energy and all of that. No, but- it actually, I think it comes in a different place. It, it comes that the music world changed so much. Hmm. And so, you know, when rock and roll was a cultural harbinger, right? And, oh. and popular music, it, you know, that everybody has got a different radio station or everybody's got, you know, a different Spotify playlist. So there are different things that unify people over music. And it, and it's just, it became more niche. The definition and the, and the, a lack of melding that there was when, when we were coming up, you know, now hip hop rap R and B is a, you know, has a lot of different meanings. Certainly rock has a few different meanings and genres. The whole kind of boy band pop thing is an interesting thing. I don't know. I, I, the, the, the social climate is not right for that kind of majestic culture changing music to happen. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Bigger thought. I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, again, I think, I think there's plenty of good music out there. There's plenty of crap, but I think it's too soon to, to tell like not, know. not again, not a comment on the, on the quality of the music or the songs. Right. Let me, let me be specific. That's no, more I, about, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, and so again, with, with these, you know, Elton John, you know, the Eagles changing again, you know, a lot of the bands are kind of define that era of music kind of getting sunsetted for lack of a better word. But yeah. They're, they're you know, all going to die eventually. I mean, it's just like, it's life. It's, that's just how it works. Right. Yeah. 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 Anyway, Interesting. too philosophical. It for is. A Tuesday afternoon. And, uh, and you and I both have band practices to go to. And, well, you have to go to one. I have to stop recording so that when the door opens and fling walks in, <laughs> uh, we're not still rolling here. So I, you can't just let it roll and just let us all listen in on a fling I'm rehearsal this week. Maybe <laughs> next week. <laughs> All right, folks. That's what I got. Uh, you got anything else, Paul? No, good. Good touch and base. Yeah, this was good. What is it that we like to say, my friend? Always be performing. Always, always. Always, always. There's always so much to talk about, too, you know. We never get through our list. We never get through our list. You know, speaking of our list, though, Paul, one thing happened the other night, and that is we played no matter what. And for the first time and perhaps the last time ever, the fake ending worked. People <laughs> applauded when uh, when we stopped. So I figured, you know, what better tribute to that than to have a fake Give ending. Give a fake ending. Gig. Beautiful. I see what you did there. <laughs> Always be performing. Even when you're podcasting. 